Good morning, everybody. I am, uh, my name is Matt Rodriguez. I'm the youth pastor here at X Community Church. Uh, just to make sure everybody's alive, let's get an amen. amen. All right, all right. Uh, for those online listening, uh, give us the praise hands. Let us know you're alive. Uh, comment. And um, we're going to start off in prayer, and uh, we'll move on to Leviticus chapter 11 right after the prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, once again, Father, you bring us to your house, Father. You collect us, and we grow in your word. We grow with one another, Father, and we thank you for that. And Father, today's message is tough. It is a message on how we are to be refined in our new life after salvation. And Father, I just pray that you would convict our hearts where we must be convicted, Lord, that your word would pierce our heart, that we do not leave here the same as when we walked in. And Father, you have expectations of us. And Lord, we, it is important that we understand those expectations. So open our eyes to your truth, Father. Sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So um, if you would, open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 11. And uh, while you're doing that, this is a message on sanctification. And, and as, as I was studying this message on sanctification, the NFL draft was on. And if any of you have watched the NFL draft, I mean, it's gotten crazy. The glitz and the glamour, the a silver, gold, platinum teeth, and I mean, you name it. These guys are walking down, and, and these teams, what these teams do is they select these players. Now, before they select this player, a coach is involved. He, this coach knows what he needs, and so he chooses this player, and this player has a role to fill on that team. The player that is drafted is expected to train, he's expected to exercise, he's expected to diet. He, there's a full regimen that this player is going to endure while on that team. And the whole purpose of it is so he fulfills his role. In sanctification, that's what happens to us. We're put on Team Jesus. God has a role for us. And so what God has, he's given us this regiment. And in this regiment, as we follow it, we grow. That's the time of sanctification. Now, the difference between the football player and the believer in this whole draft process is that the football player has to do things on his own power. He's supposed to get stronger on his own power. But for the believer, our power is found in God. Amen. Leviticus 11.44 says this, You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Believers are called to live a holy life. We're to be set apart Sanctification is allowing God to rule our lives on a daily basis. First Thessalonians says this about sanctification. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. So while some of us may be saying, oh, this message ain't for me. He's talking holiness. That's for the preacher. No, no, no. It's for all believers. Each and every one of us. It is God's will that we are sanctified. Sanctification is not salvation. Although they begin at the same time, salvation is what God did for us. Jesus died on the cross to save us. It's said and it's done. We are saved. We are justified. Sanctification is what God does in us. We are his workmanship. It is a lifelong race to use the words of Paul, that we all endure as saved Christians. J.C. Ryle says this about sanctification. In justification, the word to be addressed to man is believe. Only believe. 
However, in sanctification, the word must be watch, pray, and fight. Sanctification is a process. As I said before, it is a lifetime event. And this sin is being pulled from our lives. We're being molded into the image of Jesus through the process of sanctification. Philippians chapter 2 says this, as Paul is speaking to believers on their growth, on their obedience. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God in you. To will. God in you gives you the desire to act. God gives you the power. It is God that works in you that ensures the process of sanctification. And so we see here that God is working in us. We know that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We know through Galatians 2.20 that Jesus lives in us. All three of the triune God in us, trying to work out of us as we go through this life after salvation. And so there's expectations of growth. While we were saved from the punishment of sin, from God's judgment at salvation, we're being saved from the power of sin in sanctification. And family, to be honest, some of us don't believe that. We don't believe that being freed from sin is a now thing. We only see that as a thing in heaven, as a situation in heaven. Which brings me to my first point. You are dead to sin and alive to Christ. In our old life, we were slaves to sin. The controlling power of sin ruled us. Many of us here would never repeat the things that God has pulled us away from. Many of us here will not repeat what we're still struggling with. You see, we believed God when he said he would save us from his judgment. We believed to salvation. But after those first two days, those first three days, something went wrong. It's kind of, I'm kind of back where I started. We, we have not accepted what God has told us to be true. And so we are stuck in what Paul says is our past. In Ephesians 2.1, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time or another. We were all there. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh, selfishness, and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Paul is speaking on the old position, the position away from Christ, and there's fruits of the unbeliever. There's tangible proof of an unbeliever, and it reveals itself in disobedience to God. Transgressions, sin, all those things, these are all the qualities of the lost individual. But for the believer, these qualities in Ephesians 2 are no longer who we are. We are to be separated from sin. It, it is not something that slowly is, is, it is not something that rests in our lives. We are not supposed to be comfortable with it. It is a radical amputation. Amen. And in that change, occurs. You're different. Some of us struggle and we've just accepted it. But then you make God a liar. 
Because Romans 6, 6 says this, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we shall no longer be slaves to sin. That is now. We are no longer slaves to sin. In order for us to grow in this new life, our old life had to be removed. And, and not just removed, it had to be destroyed. It had to be killed. There is no negotiating between God and sin. God has made us where we will love one and hate the other. Right. And the litmus test to a believer's maturity is in their obedience to God. Paul hammers this home when he's speaking to the Corinthians. The Corinthians... They were fighting with one another. There was disunity. And, and in their dysfunction, Paul is chastising them. You see, they're acting like normal people. And anywhere else, to act like normal people is normal. But Paul is saying, no, you are the body of Christ. You are to be abnormal. These things aren't right. And so he addresses these things and he calls them, he tells them they're acting as mere humans, that they're acting as fleshly. Their disobedience was the evidence of their immaturity of their spiritual lives. That disobedience stifled their growth. Paul tells them, I can't tell you the deep things of the word of God. It would be wasted on you because by the way you live, I see you are still who you were when you got saved. There is no growth. And so you have, I have to feed you with milk. You've been a Christian for 10 years. You should be teaching. And so the meat that I have for you, the deep and rich truth of God's word, it's wasted on you. I can't feed it to you. Most of us can relate to disobedience. After salvation, disobedience is what we battle with the flesh. There's an internal war. Not to say when we fail, we lose our salvation. Do not misunderstand. Sanctification is a battle, and battles hurt. Battles produce scars. Just look at the wrist and the feet of our Savior. And, and, and so it is important for us to understand you're not alone. You're not alone when you sit there and, and, and you say, I hear you, Pastor. Man, I fought. I, fought, I, I hear you but I don't believe you. It doesn't seem true. That's for somebody else. See, that, that's not for me. Which brings me to my second point. This is Believer's Stockholm Syndrome. You know, there, there are these movies, and, and I remember one vividly, and this is the one I'm going to reference. It's a military movie where these uh, POWs, they're, they're in these small bamboo boxes, and uh, the U.S. Army sends some soldiers in to rescue them. And these soldiers, as they come, they're, 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 they're kicking those, those bamboo things, popping them open. And one by one, the POWs come, come out running to the, to the chopper. But then there's that one, that one that won't leave. He is so used to his environment as a slave. He is so used to his environment as a captive that he cannot accept the freedom that has just been given to him. Stockholm Syndrome is a coping mechanism to a captive or abusive situation. People develop positive feelings towards their captors or abusers over time. Dare I say that some of us have developed positive feelings towards sin in our lives. It's who I am. And these things will never leave me. It's just something I have to deal with. And so we show up on Sunday. 
which is good. We read our Bibles, which is good. We pray, which is good. But we don't grow. We can't accept the things that God has done for us. We're so conditioned in the life of sin that when God himself comes and breaks open those, that, that bamboo chamber, we sit there and we hold on. I don't want to leave. How, how do you expect me to leave it all behind? My life, what I believe to be my life, my family, my entertainment, this is all I know in this chamber of sin. And so I stay back while the door is opened to freedom. I don't walk in the new life that God has given me. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus is on a mountain. He goes to pray and he sends his disciples on a boat. And as only Jesus would do, it's nighttime. These guys are in a boat. You just imagine fishing on a boat and you see somebody walking on water, right? So they, they begin to freak out. What is this? What is this? And when they realize it's Jesus, Peter, Peter gets excited. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come and I'll get down on the boat and I'll come to you. And Jesus says, come. So, so Peter steps out of the boat and he begins to walk on water. He trusted Jesus when Jesus said, come on, against what was natural. What is natural in your, in your life before Christ is sin. What is not natural afterwards is sin. You believe God for salvation. You believe God for the first two steps. But we do like Peter did. Verse 29 says this. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, came toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. We took our first two steps when we were saved. Since then, we have been sinking. I'm going to ask, have you cried out, Lord, save me? You cried out for salvation. Do you cry out for sanctification? Or are you trying to live this Christian life on your own power? You're coming to a gunfight with a knife. God has given us the power to overcome sin. Do you believe it? So we look to our friends. We look to our past. We look to our pride. And it, instead of looking at Jesus, and we fail. We fail. Our focus is disrupted. Babe in Christ, you have been freed from sin only to enslave yourself to a lie. You believe that your identity lies in that cage. You believe that these are the things who you are. You have believer's Stockholm Syndrome. See, you don't believe what God tells you you are in Ephesians 1. He says this, you are chosen. You are holy. Now you're going to be, you are. You are blameless. You are destined for adoption. You are loved. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. Do you believe it? Because if you don't believe it, it doesn't happen. If I can lie to you and make you believe you're something you're not, how can you grow in what you are? You have been chosen for this team. There is a role to be fulfilled. It will not be fulfilled until you accept that role. It's time to see yourself as God sees you. It's time to radically amputate the sin in your lives. To live a life of holiness is what's pleasing to God. And again, you're looking up here, and I understand. This message, is, it convicted me as I was, I was reading it. It convicted me as I'm writing it. It's convicted me more as I'm saying it. 
You're saying, I want to be free. You're saying, but I'm tired. I'm tired. And you've accepted the lie. Which brings me to my next point. The sanctifying battlefield. You see, sanctification is a battle. It's a battle. And Paul depicts this battle. Now, before I read this, I want you to understand that Paul, as, uh, he, he authored more books in the Bible than anyone with the help of the Holy Spirit, obviously with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Paul, a radically changed individual. And, and we be, tend to look at other humans as though they're not human. And we, we, be, we, we look around in church and we think, oh, they, they don't know the struggles. They don't know what I'm going through. Let me tell you something. We all battle. Every single one of us battle. And Paul is going to explain the frustrations of that battle. The battle with the flesh, the two things inside of me, the spirit of God and the flesh, they're at war. And here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do this I keep doing. Say what? Right? Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is, it is the sin living in me that does it. Paul is battling. You see, when he wrote the book of Philippians, when he wrote the epistles while he was in jail, Paul wasn't saying, why me, Lord? Why am I in jail? He didn't battle where God had put him, but he battles sin. It is an intrusion on the believer's life. He does not accept sin. He's not saying it's who I am. He says, this is wrong. These things need to be removed, God. Help me. Help me, Lord. It's not who I am. I hate the sin. And I battle. You're not alone in your battles. The battle of sanctification is one that leaves scars. It hurts. We're not asked to take up the armor of God each and every day because we're going to a believer's picnic. We're going to war. And the war is with sin. We're not going to wave the white flag and say, this is who I am. No, we're going to say, this is not who I am. These things have got to go. And like every other war, the enemy, the enemy wages psychological warfare. After all, and this is very important, whoever controls your mind will control your actions. And the world has put a full assault on your mind. Turn the TV on. Do you realize that every drink on television, over 70% of every drink is an alcoholic drink? Now, I'm not here to tell you that drinking alcohol is wrong. I'm here to tell you that over drinking alcohol is wrong. And I could uh, testify to that by, by looking at Harris County, looking at the Harris County Jail. There's many in there that have battled with alcohol and have lost. People have died behind alcohol. These things that we do too much of, obviously, they're they're not good. And so, movies, social trends, education, our children, what seems to be the most basic of biology is now challenged. Why? Because of how I feel? Well, I need direction. I need you to bring me back to, to, the, to God's plan. I don't need to make my own decision as a seven-year-old child. What on earth has happened to us? Sin. We accept it. And we're seeing how irrational it is. All these things are opposed to righteous living, but God gives us 
the remedy. He gives us the defense for this psychological battle. In Romans 12, 2, he says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This world has a pattern. We just talked about it. The pattern is against godliness. It's riddled with hate, revenge, uh, uh, sexuality, uh, lying, backbiting, gossip. That is the world. All these things are against a godly life. And they're all around us. And so what, what this verse in Romans is telling us is that the remedy is a transformed mind. A transformed mind that, that understands the things of God, where we grow in, 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 in a mature spiritual knowledge. The victory lies in our mind, and it must be renewed. The thought process that we had of what used to be before salvation cannot be what is after salvation. And so we go to God's word. We go to, the, to, to this, what God has given us to renew our minds, we go to the scripture that is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be what? Complete. Amen. Not just complete, but he's ready. He is now equipped for every good work. Our basic training and execution of a sanctified life lies in the growth of our spiritual knowledge. And we are to be continually training. The world that opposes us does not rest through relationships, through work, as we talked about music, movies. Constantly, we're being persuaded to go against God. Constantly, we're being uh, uh, shed as outcasts, as bigots, as we hold true to God's word. Constantly, we're being asked, hey, just give a little. Let's negotiate. You don't, you don't got to be that holy. That, that's ridiculous. And that's the world we live in. And so we are to constantly be training. We are to fight each and every day with the sword that has been handed to us. Through his word, we are equipped to live this life, to glorify him. God's sword has no equal. Right. In the battle against sin, that's what we use, his right. word. And now that our minds are in the game, now that they, we, we begin to renew our minds and we're equipped for the good works and we start to understand more of God's word, now we begin to express God's word, now we begin to live God's word, we're prepared for the battlefield of suffering and endurance. These are necessary. These are a necessary component in a sanctified life. It is through righteous suffering and endurance that God's word says we are perfected. James 1, 2 says this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that, that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Right. Say what? Count it all joy. I just lost my car. Count it all joy. This person at work hates me. Count it all joy. I've, I've just lost my job. Count it all joy. Are you crazy? It doesn't make sense. Does, what makes sense is to count it all bad. It doesn't make sense because our understanding hasn't changed. Family, when your mind has been transformed and your understanding has changed, it begins to make sense. It makes sense when you present God's word as your weapon. It makes sense when you've been equipped for God's works and it, and it is God's holiness that you seek because counting it all joy during the hardships 
It's a matter of divine perspective. And a sanctified life reveals that. Paul lived a sanctified life. For Paul, he could count it all joy in the worst of times. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What perspective that every day of my life is to live for Jesus Christ. And when I go home with him, it is even better. Stephen being stoned could count it all joy as he's explaining, as he's pleading with his with his Jewish brothers. Explaining to them that they killed the very God that they try to worship. He's being stoned. And so Stephen says this, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And he's killed. Enduring suffering. The pinnacle of the sanctified life. Are you ready to begin to grow? Are you ready to put the flag down to get off of this idea? It's who I am. Not if you're saved. Don't make my God a liar. Not if you're saved. He's not. He's not going to. He's not telling us that we're freed from sin just to have you say it's who I am. Alcoholics Anonymous has done some great things. I've had friends go through that and, and other programs. And the one thing I, cannot, I, I can't get behind is I'm Matt and I'm an alcoholic. And the reason I can't get behind that is because it's not what God's word says. It says that I'm free, that I'm loved, that I'm redeemed. I am not those things. It's what I used to be. And through the struggle, it's a struggle because I'm not allowing God in me to work out of me. I need to learn that. But for me to repeat that, I make God a liar. I can't say that. I can't get behind that. Are you ready to embrace your sanctification process? Are you ready to grow in Christ? Are you ready for the battle each and every day? If you're a mother or a father, you better be ready because the enemy hasn't stopped on your children. And if your parents can't see the scars of your battles, how will they understand how to battle themselves? If they don't see you on your knees pleading to God, save me as you're drowning like Peter, how will they know to go to God when they're in trouble? You are the example that God set to lead them to Christ. You are to provide a platform, a guidance. This is where we go to be saved. This is where we go after we're saved. We stay here. It is a submitted life to Christ each and every day. Amen. Are you ready for that? And if you are, then I want you to embrace Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Your past life is over. Get out of the cage and walk in newness of life. Let your light shine. Amen. Allow God to work through you as you live a life of submission. Let's pray.